Good morning and welcome to Arise News Now. I'm Gavin Ramjorn in London. It's Thursday the 1st of August and our top story at this hour. The votes are in and being counted to elect a new president and parliament in Zimbabwe. The turnout was high across the country, with monitors saying the process was peaceful. Current President Robert Mugabe has been involved in a power-sharing coalition with his main rival, the opposition leader Morgan Changarai, since 2009. His party claimed the, ele the electoral role has been tampered with. Lily Grimes has this report. Africa's oldest leader casts his vote. Robert Mugabe has been president of Zimbabwe since independence from Britain in 1980. It's opposition leader Morgan Changarai's third attempt to unseat the 89-year-old. Asked if he's winning, he expressed confidence. Well, I thought that uh, it's not if, it's when. <laughs> Despite the cold, queues formed outside polling stations before dawn. With no reliable opinion polls, it's hard to see who's winning. Both sides are forecasting landslide victories. But in a country with a history of election violence, the big question is whether the loser will accept the result. Mugabe, who rejects past and present charges of vote-fixing, has said he will concede if defeated. A spokesman for Changarai's Movement for Democratic Change said the party would accept the results only if the poll was free and fair. African Union observers say voting has gone well so far. Western monitors have been barred from the elections. Protests in Tunisia have intensified after eight soldiers were killed near the border with Algeria. It comes after tensions rose between the secular opposition and supporters of the Islamist-led government. As many as 20,000 people took to the streets, with many protesting for and against the government. Garlands and kisses for soldiers, hardly a common scene during the Arab Spring, but that's what Tunisians offered their military on Tuesday in downtown Tunis. They were showing support for the army, after an attack by gunmen the day before left eight soldiers dead near the border with Algeria. I am happy to see young people expressing solidarity with the army. We are all the Tunisian army. We are all devoted to our country. We want to live in peace, without violence, terrorism or threats. Monday's attack was the biggest assault on security forces here in decades. It came as tensions rise between the secular opposition and supporters of the Islamist-led government. As many as 20,000 people took to the streets on Tuesday night, some demonstrating for the government, some against. An uprising in Tunisia in 2011 set off the revolutions across the Middle East that we now call the Arab Spring. But Tunisians today are increasingly worried they're sliding back into political crisis. Now, shocking footage of train drivers on their mobile phones while they're behind the wheel has been released in Argentina. A series of videos also showed conductors reading and even asleep in some cases. The revelation comes just days after it was revealed the driver of the Spanish train crash, which left 79 dead, was also on his phone just before the crash. Security cameras captured shocking videos of Argentinian train conductors sleeping, reading books and on their mobile phones while behind the wheel. Authorities released the videos after investigation into the Buenos Aires tragedy-prone rail system. Announcing a crackdown, Transport Minister Florencio Rendazo said the drivers must now pass physical tests to ensure they do not fall asleep at the wheel. They also have to take new sets of exams that include an additional 100 hours of training. We are adding to the alert control system a blood oxygen level study that is carried out at the moment, and it works to determine if the person is predisposed to falling asleep. The results are instantaneous. We are also going to implement alerts for both medical and technical issues. The alerts have to do with alcohol and drugs. Officials said those conductors caught on tape have been fired or disciplined. 
The rail network has been criticized in recent years for its poor conditions and lack of investment in staff and infrastructure, leading to many deadly accidents. Now, members of Uruguay's House of Representatives have passed a bill to legalize marijuana. If it gets approved, the country will become the first to allow production, distribution and sale of the drug. The initiative, backed by the president, Jose Mujica, is designed to take profits away from dealers and to divert users from harder drugs. Only the government would be permitted to sell marijuana under the plans and buyers would have to be over 18 and be registered on a database. Before the 2011 tsunami, tourists came to the beaches of Rikuzen Takata in the northeast of Japan to relax. Now the tourists are back, but this time they come to spend their holidays among the mountains of debris littering the coastline. Antoine Bouthier reports. Once famous for its emerald green waters and sandy beaches, the town of Rikuzen Takata and its surroundings in the northeast of Japan were completely destroyed in the 2011 tsunami. The tourists are now coming back, but for a different reason. I came to see that there is no progress in the rebuilding, two and a half years after the disaster. I also came to see the pine tree of hope, the only one to have survived the tsunami. This pine, the only survivor from a forest of about 70,000 trees, is known all over Japan as a symbol of the rebuilding efforts and is now the town's main attraction. But for many, the reconstruction isn't happening fast enough, a victim of layers of bureaucracy and political paralysis. The tour organizers, who are from the area, say this new kind of tourism is helping. Every day, the tourists have lunch in these prefabricated restaurants, and we take them to several souvenir shops. We bring consumers. This can only have a positive impact on the region's economy. The coach stops by a shop that specializes in various produce from the sea, key to the local economy before the tsunami. The disaster tourists are helping local businesses get back on their feet, but sometimes this voyeuristic tourism can be unnerving. When tourists just ask me point-blank how many people died, that kind of morbid curiosity bothers me. But if they ask how I'm doing or they encourage me to keep moving forwards, I'm grateful. Two and a half years after a disaster that killed 1,800 people in this town alone, the morning is still far from over. To pay their respects, the tourists each lay a flower, which is included in the cost of the trip. Now, food trucks are everywhere in most American cities and especially in the nation's capital where new laws have been made uh, to make it easier for these diners on wheels. But traditional restaurant owners claim they're now at a disadvantage and worry the competition is here to stay. William Edwards has more. It's lunchtime in downtown Washington and there's not a parking space in sight. Dozens of food trucks converge here at the same time every day and the queues build up quickly. For a couple of hours, the whole square becomes an open-air restaurant. Um, I like that we can all get whatever we want to eat and then we can all just come together and enjoy the sunshine. Well, this is my first time at the food trucks in D.C. and we got the hot dog stand and it was really good and big and messy and fun and I think it's cool that they have lots of options around here. Customers can sample the flavors of the Caribbean, Mexico or perhaps Indonesia as well as more local cuisine, of course. From small beginnings, the food truck business has seen explosive growth and is still expanding by more than 8% each year nationwide. The local authorities have now amended legislation to reflect the new situation. Uh, in June, D.C. Council had passed and Mayor Gray had signed uh, new food truck regulations and it really brought to a close a process that's gone on for years. Uh, the updated food truck regulations that are now almost 40 years old uh, so it was a significant accomplishment. The new laws envisage a lottery system for parking permits and seem to confirm that food trucks are here to stay. But this isn't something that traditional restaurants are keen to hear. Michael is the youngest member of the Rim family who run a restaurant on a square that's become a mecca for food trucks. For him, the new arrivals aren't playing by the same rules. 
obviously, you know, we are in a business to make money and they are stealing competition. But at the same time, it's just like what I said, it's just not, I don't see it, how, I don't see it as being fair because, you know, we do a lot of work to make sure that we, we keep to the guidelines and the standards that the uh, Department, Department of Health uh, puts us on. Now, I feel like they don't have to do as much work. The Food Truck Association denies such claims. What's clear is that here, as in other cities, these culinary rivals are going to have to cook up a compromise. Now, one of Africa's biggest cultural events outside the continent begins today. Africa Fashion is expected to draw 20,000 visitors to London. UK and international fashion designers inspired by Africa will be showing their latest creations. It's all to help young creators get their foot in the industry. And our arts and culture reporter, Jason Mansare, is there for us. Jason, hello. How is it all going? Good morning, Gavin. It's going absolutely wonderful. Currently, we're in the Truman Brewery, the old Truman Brewery in East London, Brick Lane. And the energy, even though the catwalk hasn't been built, which is going to go just along here, is absolutely fantastic. If you take a look over my shoulder, you can see all the models have arrived already. And as you said there, it's going to be a huge event, a huge cultural event for Africa. Over 100 exhibitors and designers are expected to attend. And of the crowd, the crowd, 20,000 people expected to come over the three days. Now this is massive because it only started three years ago and when it started they only had 50 exhibitors and designers and only about three or four thousand visitors. So you can see that African fashion is starting to have a place globally. Top stuff, Jason. Yes, so like you say, having a place globally is very important. We've got Madrid Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week, London Fashion Week. What is it about Africa that is important to put this on the map? Well, I think because people have been using the designs for so many years and we're also seeing it pop up all over the place. All you need to do is look in London's High Street, let's say Oxford Street, go into something like Topshop and you will see hundreds, if not, if not more designs that have African influences, whether it be jewellery, t-shirts, shirts and all of those sort of things. ASOS is another big one. They actually have an ASOS, ASOS Africa brand strand which employs people in Kenya to create items for that, for that line. So I think what we're seeing is massive interest in the African brands and, and the African influences and not just taking them by other designers, actually letting these designers from those countries really shine. And Jason, do we know who's going to be exhibiting down there today? Yeah, we know that there's going to be over 100 exhibitors. Uh, there's so many to name. We're going to have a couple of them actually on the program at 11 o'clock talking about how they work but most importantly it's, remember, it's important to remember that they're not just from the African continent it's also people from the diaspora so all over the world people who are influenced, influenced and inspired by Africa will be coming here to show their designs uh, for the global audience and another point we have to make is African Fashion Week is really important because it creates profile and buzz which means that international media suddenly takes more interest in these designers and so too do the international buyers and therefore African fashion is able to prosper in the global fashion market. And do we know who the customers will be? Who's going to be buying this African fashion? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. If we take a look at the UK, it's interesting to note that 70% of the people who buy African brands are actually not from Africa. They're quite possibly from uh, the UK, America and China. And of course, if we're talking about exports, it's places like China um, and Latin America who have these huge populations and huge consumer markets that these designers could really benefit from taking advantage of. And also, Jason, this is quite a, a middle class thing, isn't it? Uh, many people in Africa are too uh, poor to buy clothes that are being exhibited today. So this is quite a, a rich, um, I guess you could say, a rich sort of activity, isn't it? I think if you're talking about couture, definitely. But all we have to do is take a look at the high street here and you realise that fashion is no longer illegal. It's no longer excluding any sort of demographic or socio-economic bracket. It's very, very inclusive. Now, perhaps some of the, the, uh, the materials used um, can increase the price, but if you're looking for, you know, original fashion or original African designs, I don't think that many people are being classed out of it. And also, we have to remember we're creating an industry. So therefore, when you create an industry, you create jobs. That passes on to the uh, people in the community. I mean, well, they Jason, and I've got to stop you there. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Love the shirt, by the way. Brilliant stuff. Thanks again. We'll have more from Jason uh, throughout the day, of course. More news throughout the day. Thanks very much for watching.